and waiting for it. And we're gone. All right. Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rebecca Glass. I have been doing HEMA now for six and a half years-ish. And the topic of uh, Jewish contributions to the HEMA canon and the context in which this happened uh, was originally originally came up in a discussion I was having in Jess Finley. So I would like to give Jess the credit where it's due for inspiring the idea. And to start, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and share with you a couple of images. So this image, or the images that I'm going to share are taken from the Glasgow Fecht book, which is known for containing the treatise of Sigmund Ringek and not Yud, among others. These particular folios, uh, folio 32 uh, recto, 33 recto, and verso, are part of the Nuremberg group, an anonymous set of manuscripts describing common techniques. And in particular, I want you to notice the uh, sorry, uh, the circular badge, hopefully you can see where I'm highlighting. Uh, the, the circular badge that the fencer is wearing. You can see it here in this one. You can also see it here in this one. Now, there's not a ton of detail in these images. There's no extraneous detail. So it, is, it seems very unlikely that the artists would have included anything that was not particularly relevant to the image or anything that they didn't think was particularly necessary. Well, the badge that they were wearing is very similar to the badges that Jews in the Holy in Augsburg were required to wear starting in 1434 before spreading to other German cities. And if you look here, you can see the badge on Jewish clothing in 16th century Germany. And the badge is, or the idea of a Jewish badge is actually fairly old. You can see it in images. I'm sorry, I don't have an actual printout, but you can see it in images from much earlier as well. So it seems highly unlikely that this badge would be included in an illustration reported to be of Ot Yud and his student unless the artist wanted to point out that, hey, this guy is Jewish. So we mostly hear of Jews in the Middle Ages as being persecuted beyond comprehension, persecuted, expelled, forced to convert, and so on. And while these things did occur, the massacres, the uh, anti-Semitic laws, and so on, the traditional narrative is not the whole story. As it turns out, and as this lecture will address, Jews did bear arms. They helped to defend their cities, and they occasionally enjoyed fencing as a recreational hobby. So the first question that we have to be able to answer in order to look at the subject is, how do we define who is a Jew? And how does that question differ today than it did in the 1400s. Today, in mainstream American society, we look at Judaism as a religion. You are Jewish if you practice your religion, and you can stop being Jewish by converting to another religion. If you convert to Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, that's all it takes to stop being Jewish. However, in the Middle Ages, and according to many practicing Jews today, being Jewish is more complex than just being a religion. So I'm going to go off on a brief tangent for a moment 
and ask, how many of you have ever done a DNA test on like 23andMe or Ancestry.com? Some of you, I imagine, most of you have your video off, but I imagine that, that some of you have, have done this. And many of you probably got a result that was something like 30% Iberian, 50% German, 10% British or something like that. Well, my ancestors came to the US from uh, Russia, Romania, Lithuania. So you might expect that that's what would come up on my DNA test, but that's not what I got. What I got was that I was 99% Ashkenazi, uh, which means 99% Jewish of Eastern European descent. Uh, if you see the terms Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and Mizrahi, these are terms that are used to describe Jewish communities based on where they are from. So Ashkenazi Jews are from Eastern Europe, uh, started starting in France and moving to points east throughout the Middle Ages. Sephardic Jews are originally from Spain, and Mizrahi Jews are from the Middle East and Northern Africa. Uh, now, this doesn't en encompass the entire Jewish community. There are Jews in India, China, uh, Yemenite Jews, Ethiopian Jews, and so on. Um, and of course, there's been intermarriage and so on. But as a general rule of thumb, those are those three groups will encompass most Jewish people that you meet, especially in the United States. So what does it mean that my results came out as 99% Ashkenazi? That means that genetically I have more in common with an Ashkenazi Jew living in Israel that I've never met and probably will never meet than I do with say a neighbor of mine who might have originally been from Romania. In the Middle Ages, there was no way to test for DNA, but there were rudimentary ideas about genetics and inheritance. Uh, if we consider the rules of primogenitor, primogeniture and nobility, which are based around the ideas that children will share certain traits of their parents. Being Jewish wasn't just a matter of the religion you profess, but it was also your ethnicity and your nationality. So the same way that one could be Castilian or English or French, that was how one was also Jewish. The big difference, of course, was that at the time there was no Jewish state or more accurately, no Jewish kingdom as ideas of modern statehood don't really take hold until the 16th, 17th century or so. Wherever Jewish people in Western Europe settled, they were considered foreigners and they were often treated as such. And this at a time when xenophobia was extremely common. There were, of course, exceptions to this rule. Medieval Spain uh, particularly uh, is notable as being a place tolerant of people of different faiths. But as a rule, full citizenship and legal equality in Europe was only for Christian citizens. So what is a medieval Jewish person to do if they don't want to deal with the added taxes, xenophobia, and the laws that were meant to humiliate them? Well, the answer, it would seem, would be conversion to Christianity. However, it's important to note that not all conversions are equal. Most people will divide conversions into two types. Uh, the first type of conversion is completely voluntary. This is where you say, I believe with all my heart and soul that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Please teach me the catechism of the Christian church and baptize me so that I might join you. And the second type is a forced conversion where someone's got a knife to your throat and I say, accept Jesus or you know whomever as your Savior or I'm going to kill you or you will be burned at the stake um, or a forced conversion also occurs when someone who does not have the cognitive ability to consent is converted. It's possible that uh, Yud was a member of a group of children that were converted um, by the Austrian Archduke in the early 1400s. Now, I also personally, um, and this is my personal thing, I don't have 
any academic things to, to back this up yet, but I do like to make this a point, is that there are conversions that exist in the middle ground. Uh, these are people converting because not necessarily because they believe in Jesus Christ, but because they don't want to deal with the social stigma of being Jewish anymore. Uh, they want to be able to be a member of a certain profession. They want um, to ha not have to pay certain taxes. They want certain other benefits, um, or at least a uh, release from the oppressive laws. Now, medieval people, as we all like to say, weren't stupid. And they knew that not every conversion of a Jewish person to Christianity was strictly voluntary. And the fear of reversion or Judaizing or going back to being Jewish or converting other people to Judaism was intense. In both inquisitions in Spain and later in Venice, the targets of the inquisitions were usually converted Jews whose loyalty was questioned. In fact, in Venice, especially in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, it was safer, albeit more degrading, to openly practice and profess Judaism than it was to convert to Christianity. Uh, as one poem in German goes, and apologies for my butchery of the pronunciation, Ich halte Juden für Juden, sie seien getauft oder beschnitten, Sind sie nicht all einer ankannt, gehören sie doch all in ein Sund, sie deinen auch gleich einem Gott, den Christus Mammon genannt hat, welcher mit sein deinen endlich gleich, wird fahren in des Tafelsreich. The translation, a Jew is a Jew, baptized or circumcised for all I care, even if they are of diverse origins, they belong to a guild. They all serve one God whom Christ named Mammon, who in the end with the servants will go to the devil's oven. So when we read of someone like Ot Yud being a baptized Jew, we must understand the possibility, if not the likelihood that he and others were never fully accepted as being Christian. And thus you have references to the baptized Jew. So what was life like for medieval Jew? The period of most of our Hema study, so say about 1300 to 1550, was one of general decline for most Western European Jews. England was the first country that expelled their Jews. Uh, Edward I expelled them in 1290 after about a century's worth of persecution. Uh, but the Jewish community in England was never large to start with. France followed with an, with an expulsion in 1296, readmittance a few years later and expulsion for good, at least until the 17th century, in 1394. The expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 is probably the most well-known example. In all of these cases, expulsion was preceded by persecution and massacres, some instigated by the government, and many the result of popular rioting. The underlying causes can range from the traditional, uh, the Jews killed Christ, the Jews denied Christ anti-Semitism, to needing someone to blame or scapegoat for floods, famines, and most notably the Black Death. Now, England, Spain, and France all differ from the German territories in one specific way. England, France, and Spain were all centralized states. Germany, or at least as we think of Germany, didn't exist as such. There was the Holy Roman Empire, the ob obligatory not holy, not Roman, not an empire, where cities more or less operated as city-states, and territory included parts of modern-day Poland and the Czech Republic. Thus, laws concerning Jews can and did vary from place to place. When Augsburg introduced the Jewish bed, excuse me, when Augsburg introduced a Jewish badge. It at first only applied to Augsburg and then was adopted by the other city-states. One early German law, and the law is taken from this book, 
uh, Jury Law in Medieval Germany. It is a great resource, except for the fact that everything is in German. So needed some help with the translation. Uh, but thanks to Jack Gassman, uh, one law states, the Jews have different customs and rights in one land than the other, and also the laws, and also the laws are different from one city to the other. In some cities and lands, they have inherited goods, fields, vineyards, uh, fields and woods. There they have their freedom and right to it. In some cities like Rome, there they must wear crafts and must wear special clothes for the Christians. In some lands, it is wished that they not stay not more than two or three in a city. But in German countries, there they go lazy and profitable or frivolous. The described law provides that their frivolity should be moderate. Should they go above it, the princes or cities in which they live step in, so shall the honorable court or the council of a city punish or curb their frivolity. It is worth noting that this time period is when the Jewish migration to Poland began as Jews were forced from west to east they, that is how many Jewish communities ended up in Eastern Europe. And the golden age of Polish Jew, of uh, Jewish civilization in Poland uh, from about 1550 to 1630 began more or less as a direct result from the persecutions and expulsions in Western Europe. So uh, moving on, although the ghetto as such was only beginning to form, Jewish neighborhoods were common. This was a result of both Christian prejudice and Jewish religious necessity to segregate themselves. For example, a Jewish community needs access to a kosher butcher, a synagogue you can walk to, and other communal areas. Oftentimes, these neighborhoods, which were seldom large enough to support the growth of their population, became the open air prison ghettos that come to mind when we think of the word ghetto. Jews were also limited in the trades they could practice. These limitations became greater as time progressed. While Jewish physicians were known, especially in Spain, the most well-known Jewish occupation involved frequent contact with Christian community was that of money lending. As much as possible, Jewish communities attempted to be self-sustaining, including having their own courts, but the cases that the courts were allowed to try varied from place to place and from time to time. In some cases, a Jewish court could try any case short of a capital one or one where a Christian was the victim. In others, jurisdiction was relegated to matters of Jewish law only. Trying a case in a Christian court was to be avoided at all costs. And the, community, the Jewish community held that the worst crime wasn't murder, but informing. This is somewhat similar to some other groups, perhaps. So when looking at Jews and bearing arms, first I want to mention uh, some of my own limitations, which I've already hinted at. First, I don't speak German like at all. And I speak very, very little Hebrew, basically tourist survival Hebrew. So that means that I am relying on the translations of others. And as anyone who has ever used Wiktenauer can tell you, the same five words can have 10 different translations. Secondly, when looking through the lens of HEMA, as in looking through HEMA manuscripts and published uh, HEMA works, there's relatively little about Jewish populations. So most of the research I've done has come from Jewish oriented sources. That said, the most common underlying sentiment here is the following. By law, Jews were often either barred from carrying arms or barred from carrying them in certain circumstances, but the reality was different. To start with, we're going to take a look at a couple other images, and I usually have a handout for this, but since this is virtual, I don't. But we have in our Jewry Law book, we have two images of a Jewish man on horseback. And you can tell that he's Jewish from the hat, the Judenhut, as it were. And you can see he is carrying a sword. The 
the second of these images. You can see a group of men holding pole arms. And right at the end, there is another man there wearing a Jew's hat. These images come straight from medieval manuscripts regarding Jewish law. These include laws such as clerics and Jews who carry weapons and are not tonsured or do so without right shall be arrested. They should be fined as laymen for they should bear such weapons that are grasped with the king's grateful decree. And another one, clerics and Jews that are not untonsured follow their laws and do the thing they shall be fined as a layman. And so it is, if one finds a longest messer with them or finds them in an inn or whorehouse, they are bound by the same laws. If a cleric is a guest at an inn, he doesn't lose his rights. If he is living there with permanent apartments, then he shall be fined as a layman. In the images I showed, we clearly see men identifiable as Jews. And in fact, if we look at these laws more closely, we can see that they aren't blanket bans as such. The first, one, the first law I recited includes the phrase without right, while the second distinguishes between a guest and a permanent resident. In Cologne in the 11th century, Jews enjoyed the right of carrying arms and fought along burghers in a 1252 fight between the archbishop and the city. As late as 1372, long after the previously mentioned laws were promulgated, the jury privilege explicitly mentions an obligation to assist the city in defense. To put the year 1372 in, in context, Jews were victims of a massacre there in 1349 and expelled from Cologne in 1422. So even among rising uh, persecution, there were still instances in which Jews were not only allowed to bear arms, but expected to. And as we've discussed before, German territories at the time did not have a centralized government and laws from one city to another could vary. It wasn't often feasible for Jews to be protected, that's protected, while traveling from city to city. And it wasn't unusual to hear of a Jew traveling to attempt to disguise themselves as a Christian. Within city limits, it was sometimes expected that Jews might bear arms, especially in times of war when all help was needed for a city's defense. Remember the obligation of the Jews of Cologne. One document states that the Jews of Laybach participated in fortifying city walls in 1478 while Frederick III is cited in 1486 in requiring Jews of his empire to supply gunpowder. One Jewish source mentions a Jew borrowing a suit of armor and weapons to fight the enemy with their city's other inhabitants. And it was not unknown for Jews to serve as mercenaries, even outside their city walls. There is a record of an Italian Jew serving as a landsnacht in the late 16th century. In fact, those interested in early modern history or Jewish migration to Eastern Europe may be intrigued by comparing how Jews were often legally kept from arms in Western Europe, but required to sign up for conscription in Eastern Europe in the 1700s and 1800s. So for conclusions, this, meaning this lecture, is a starting point. We now know that the traditional narrative of Jewish life glosses over many of the complexities and that the law and reality weren't always in sync with one another. We still don't really know much about Ot Yud or Yud Lev or Andres Yudin other than that they exist, but we can now get a better picture for the restrictions they would have likely faced and how being baptized did not necessarily mean immediate acceptance into Christian society. This is a topic that is begging for more research. Uh, some of you, uh, along with myself, uh, listened to Sarah Offenberg's lecture yesterday about uh, fencing images in Hebrew manuscripts. And Sarah herself mentioned that she's only been researching this for about six months or so. This is a pretty new thing. And it's absolutely begging for more research, especially from anyone who has the requisite language skills. So sources from this time period, 
will mostly be in medieval German, Hebrew, or Latin. Uh, Yiddish, as we think of it today, didn't really exist as such, as modern Yiddish is a com combination of both German Jewish dialects and Slavonic Jewish dialects. So for sources in, my, in our time period, the language skills that you'll want are medieval German and Hebrew. Uh, I'm working on it, but I got a long way to go before I'm there. Uh, for those of you who would like more sources, uh, feel free to uh, email me or you can ask me right here. I'm in the middle of my crazy library and can pull books from the shelves. Um, but uh, as for now, I hope that you enjoyed it and might have learned something. And uh, given that we have a whole half hour left, if there are any questions or any discussion, uh, please feel free. Hi, well, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it was really wonderful. I'm super excited about this. Uh, second, uh, you had made mention of a Jewish Lands Connect. I was wondering if you had their name or any more info about them. Uh, I don't have their name on me, uh, but I will look for it and get back to you. Any other comments, questions, suggestions? Sure. I have a question. The chat. Um, There's some questions. Oh, okay. I'll check that out. So sorry. Uh, Aislinn, why don't you go ahead? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about the pictures from um, RingX document. Um, so you were talking about them showing the badges, but um, do we know much about like who those people were? Was that like RingX himself or... Um, do you have any history there? So the Glasgow fact book, and I will draw up a link in the chat. One second. Uh, the Glasgow fact book includes both Ringek and Ot Yud. Um, as far as I know, we don't know for sure who the images are, uh, but I am assuming that since the images are of wrestlers that the wrestler with the badge is uh, Yud, especially as when you scroll through them, the badge eventually changes to the badge of uh, Maximilian. And we know that um, Ot Yud was a appointed the wrestling uh, master to an archduke um, in the territory that the Mac Maximilian, the homely Roman Empire would have overseen. So uh, Hayden Montgomery asks, how does the treatment of Jews and baptized Jews change with the Catholic and Protestant schism? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, it is a little after the time period in which I'm looking at, I'm looking at mostly the uh, 1400s here and the Reformation, more Martin Luther posts his thesis in 1519 and most of my knowledge of the Reformation has to do with the English Reformation. But uh, as my husband would point out, that because of the Catholic and the Catholic and Protestant schism caused a reactionary uh, movement from the Catholic Church, and that led to more persecution. And that's where in Italy, that's when you start to see the beginning of the Italian ghettos, the Venetian ghetto and uh, so on and a very precipitous decline in the status of Roman Jews who had for centuries been protected by the Pope were, I believe in the 1550s, I might be wrong on the date, but I believe in the 1550s they were told convert or be expelled. 
Uh, Dash? Um, I don't know. I missed the beginning of your lecture, so my apologies if you covered this. But um, one thing I've noticed in some of my own research is that there's um, a lot of uh, references I've found to Jewish goldsmiths working on swords. Um, I think I mean, probably, probably hilting uh, blades that have been made elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was other kind of an interesting potential sort of entry point to the world of swords for uh, Jews in medieval Europe, and I was just curious if you looked into that at all. Uh, I've seen a little bit of that. Um, I can't remember the reference, but there was at least one, I, I ran across at least one instance of um, a Jew being made, uh, a Jewish person being involved in sword making. Um, I've also, and perhaps more commonly, run into areas in which Jews were responsible for provisioning uh, troops um, or uh, supplying uh, the conditori in uh, Renaissance Italy, uh, supplying them with, um, what's the word for it, provisions um, that they needed to um, wage war. Uh, that sort of managerial merchant-ish kind of role, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, um, one that this all comes from like the epilogue of a book on Jews in Renaissance Italy, but it mentions a man named Abraham Coloni, who was apparently a fencing master. Uh, U Penn has a copy of Coloni's text, but it is in Latin. Latin is not a language that I speak. I went to school in New Jersey. I learned Spanish. Incredibly useful in daily life, not quite as useful when researching medieval Germany. Right, yeah. So do you think that Kalorny's text talks about fencing, or...? I believe it talks about fencing, but I would need to actually read it to be sure. Okay. I just posted a, a link in the chat. Those swords were hilted by a Jewish goldsmith. So that was kind of a fun detail. Yeah. Uh, Zach says, I missed the discussion yesterday. What else could you say about Hebrew manuscripts that showed fencing? Uh, for me, the thing that really interested me was that in some medieval Bibles, there are pictures, um, there the types of pictures where the words form the outline of the picture, which is interesting as an art concept itself. Uh, but the images are fairly similar to the images that you see in I-33. And these Bibles actually predate I-33. To me, that was really fascinating. Uh, one of the possible reasons for this was that sword and buckler was just that common. Um, but it's kind of interesting to sort of think about and um, try and, I guess, wrap your head around. Uh, in the Bibles, in the, in the one Bible, Professor Offenberg mentioned, um, these images are paired with a passage out of Jeremiah, and the purpose seems to be to warn Jewish communities of Christian violence. Uh, um, this is uh, somewhat uh, conjecture, I guess, but, this Bible was written pretty soon after one of the massacres of Jewish people, uh, the Rheinfleisch massacres, I believe, uh, wherein 4,000 Jews were killed. So the admonishment to, hey, take care, be careful, these guys might harm you, seems to be well within the reasons for having such imagery. Uh, it's also worth noting in Hebrew manuscripts, especially in Hebrew Bibles, it's really common in the medieval period to replace um, heads, heads of people with heads of animals. And this is primarily done because of the uh, commandment that shalt not make any graven image type thing and a general aversion to depicting human beings in Jewish art. And yes, uh, 
Uh, Michael says the images were done in micrography. That is the correct word. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts, questions, suggestions, want to point out inaccuracies? <laughs> Uh, perhaps this is uh, beyond the scope of uh, what you had researched, but um, did you find anything about uh, Sephardim and uh, what was going on in Spain or, or anything like that? A little bit. Um, there is. I will grab this book. This is the greatest thing about doing electronic libraries. I can just grab the book. Uh, Communities of Violence, highly recommend. Um, basically... For a very, very long time, Spain was the center of toleration in medieval Europe, and Iberian uh, fencing masters, uh, Iberian Jewish fencing masters, are are something that happens. Um, I can't say with any accuracy as to how common it was, but it happened enough to be noted, um, and they could be fencing masters to quite high-ranking people, and the um, in, in medieval Spain, while Spain was under Moorish control, violence against Jewish communities more or less depended on the dynasty that was in control. So under some Moorish dynasties, Jews lived more or less normal lives. Um, in others, there was a lot of persecution. Uh, Maimonides, who is probably the most famous medieval Jewish philosopher, uh, had to flee Spain um, to escape persecution. So, you know, it's not all hunky-dory, but um, in, um, <clears throat> but uh, there are long periods of toleration um, for uh, Jews in Spain, and it only really starts to decline in the uh, 14th century, um, and then throughout the 15th century as the Reconquista uh, begins to make the, the final push to retake all of Spain, and then it culminates with the 1492 expulsion. Uh, but before the expulsion, uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, this, uh, Jewish, a, a Jewish fencing masters did exist in Iberia. Uh, Michael says, are you familiar with Elena Lurie's article, A Jewish Mercenary in the Service of the King of Aragon? Uh, it is not currently ringing a bell, but I will now check it out for sure. And so there's, like I said, this is meant to be a starting point and there was a lot of research still to be done. And as you know, per the conversation we're having, I've mostly looked at the German speaking areas around the time of Lichtenauer, but there's considerably more. There are Jewish communities in Italy um, and we have uh, guys like Bondi Damaso, who were almost certainly Jewish writing rapier texts in the 1600s. Um, there's, if you go back Further, um, before the Jews get expelled from England, there are sources mentioning, mentioning about whether or not Jews are eligible for knighthood or to fight in tournaments in medieval England. Um, so it's just, it's a topic that is just begging for more people to look at, to get involved. And one of the things that really attracts me about it is because it's a way to flip the traditional narrative on its head. So growing up as a Jewish American, I went to public school and then after public school, I went to Hebrew school. And the Jewish history I got taught was you, you get taught the events of the Bible, you get told about the 1492 expulsion from Spain, and then you go straight to the shtetl or the, the Russian persecutions and the Holocaust. There's not any time or any room devoted to what 
medieval and early modern life was like for Jewish communities. And life was just as colorful for Jewish communities as it was for Christian communities. Even with all the bad, there was still a lot of good. And you only need to look at um, the Jewish manuscripts, these wonderful illuminated manuscripts that survived, or uh, Jewish clothing that survives to understand that it was a very rich, complex society. And it mostly gets glossed over or sim grossly simplified. And any last thoughts, comments? Uh, I'm guessing not. Well, thank you all for coming and listening. I hope you learned something. Uh, if I didn't tell you anything you already know, I'm sorry. Uh, but thanks for coming anyway. <laughs> and this is something that I hope to keep looking at and keep re researching. But like I, man like I mentioned, my language skills are a major stumbling block. So I'm doing what I can. But for anyone who does have the language skills, there's that much more that you are going to be able to do. Uh, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, stay safe. Hug your puppies and your kitties for me. Thank you, Rebecca. You're very welcome. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hi. Um, this might be a stupid question. Uh, what are the names of these guys that you um, are referring to? I am not much of a HEMA person. I don't know. You probably met me once. Um, my partner Chris Earls is the HEMA. The HEMA. Oh, I, know, uh, I know Chris Earl. very well. Uh, yes, I hope she is uh, doing I'm, well. Um, so yes. you're asking about Adya, Dudlev, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Do their names literally just mean like Lou uh, the Jew? Jew? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they okay. Do. Yeah. Okay. And is that a name that they would have given themselves, or is that a name that they would there's, have been known as? Uh, there's debate about this. Uh, it's yeah. because the written references to these people are so few, we have no way of actually knowing. Mm -hmm. So we know that there was a wrestling master appointed to the Archduke, and apparently he was a baptized Jew. Beyond that, we don't really know anything. Yeah. Um, and I'm more familiar with him than I am you'd love or Andres Yudin, but we're assuming that these people exist and these were the names that they wanted to be known by. Right. Um, we're assuming that they existed and they were Jewish or born Jewish, um, and not simply a, a Christian masquerading as a Jew. And that yeah. actually gets... Context. <laughs> it gets into some really interesting, like, esoterica, because there was a big tradition at the time, a big academic tradition um, to look at, like, the Old Testament and Jewish culture and adapt it for the Christian lifestyle. Um, there's a yeah. book called Swords, Science, and Society. Hmm. Um and it, it's in another room, so I can't just go grab it, unfortunately. But there, there's a passage in that book about how it seems awfully coincidental that, um, say, there, there's Hebrew in the Talhafer manuscript. Um, you have guys like At Yud um, in the Lichtenauer society. Um, and, you know, the most of the societies, Christian or we're assuming it's Christian, um, but there's the, an idea that the Jewish influence might have been a lot more than we generally accept. And 
generally in medieval communities um, and even in a lot of modern Jewish communities, there's this idea that, you know, that one of the worst things you, you can do is convert from Judaism or assimilate to wider society. Yeah. But if you look at Judaism in America, like you've got someone like me who, by the way I'm dressed, you would have no no idea that I'm Jewish. The only way you know I'm yeah. Jewish is you can maybe figure it out from my name. But yeah. other than that, the only way you know is if I tell you, like, that's how assimilated I am. Um, whereas in an Orthodox community, you can usually tell by dress because Orthodox Jews dress in a distinctive manner. Yeah. And there's a, so like, this is what it's like today. And it was, and it's been most of this way for the 20th century in Western societies. What's to say that in medieval society, um, uh, I should have probably stopped pressing record at this point. But anyway, um, what's to say that in medieval society that some Jews didn't try and assimilate as much as they could? Yeah. You know, w within the, the parameters that, that were available. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting to think about because there's just, there's so much more to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And this would have been, what time period are you referring to? Like, uh, so for the Lichtenauer time period, you're basically yeah. looking at 1350 to about 1500. Okay, so they would have. My understanding is that Ashkenazim at that point would have been in sort of France, Germany, Central, Central Europe. They definitely wouldn't have been in Eastern Europe yet. Uh, mostly Germany and Central Europe. Um, by that time, they were had mostly been expelled from France. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there was so, expulsions by like fourteen. I don't know, fourteen hundreds maybe. Um, and then like throughout the fourteen hundreds, the Jews are getting expelled from the German areas, yeah. and it's oh, I, I forget the year offhand. But at some point in the 1500s, the Polish king invites the Jews to come over and stay. And at this point, when you're looking at early modern Europe, Poland is actually the most diverse country in Europe. And it's the, I think it's the largest country in Europe at that yeah. time period as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but the we don't tend to think of Poland as being a very diverse country today. But yeah. then you had you had Jews, you had. Um, uh, Turks from the Ottoman Empire that right. came to trade and whatnot. You had Russians, you had Western Europeans. It was the most ethnically diverse country of the of the time period. And the, the golden age of Polish Jewry was a real golden age. Yeah, and, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just starting to learn about that history. I'm not nearly as academic as you are, it seems, surrounded by your books, but I am, you know, trying to... <laughs> just, I really like books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, Yivo has a class, the the Yiddish Institute or whatever. They have a class that's going on for free um, that you can take. And I don't know if you're interested in it, but I've been taking that and the history of Ashkenaz, and that's uh, been a good primer on trying to like learn about uh, historic Poland and and this migration into that and sort yeah. of the development of Yiddish and. Um, all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, and I mean, I don't really know how to characterize, um, something like Vilna, which is almost like the, the Polish seem to have a very, I don't, I don't want to monopolize your time here too much. No, that's here. fine. I've, I have an hour to go before I have to do anything, so gotcha. feel free. Right, I'm just, I'm just talking for the sake of talking here, you know, why not? Um, it seemed really interesting to me that the Polish had like a, an interesting setup that I can't really grasp the details of, but it's almost like that the Jews in Vilna were given somewhat free reign to have their own city state. Um, yeah. that was kind of, it, it was still under Polish nobility, um, you know, you would have to sort of cede control to Polish nobility if and when they sort of told you so, but otherwise, um, yeah. 
it was kind of just that, a self-sufficient state that they would tax. And and that's more or less, you know, why um, Jewish sources would consider it a golden age because they more or less let the Jewish communities function without interference and and with a semblance of equality. And it might not have been, I mean, there was obviously interaction between Christians and Jews and so on. Um, it might not have been full assimilation like modern American society, um, but being able to manage their own affairs and being in charge of their own affairs was a big enough deal to be noteworthy. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ashley. Hi, Sam. Uh, please let me know if you have any thoughts or questions. Um, okay, will do. Um, you have unfortunately missed the lecture. Oh my goodness, and central time versus... I am guessing that you are in central time, yeah. Oh, um, yep. The good news, however, is that we've recorded this. In fact, it's still recording because I haven't re remembered to turn off the record button. Um, but <laughs> we'll have it up on our website and Facebook and, and so on, so you'll be able to see it. But I do have time to kill. I don't have enough time to do the entire lecture again, but if you have any uh, particular questions, hey, feel free. I would be more helpful uh, if I'd seen everything else before, but I will check That's that fair. out. Where can I find that when it's ultimately uploaded? So we will have it somewhere on gmac.club. Um, we'll yeah, also be posting. Uh, we will also be posting it to our Facebook page and relevant Facebook groups. Can you say that URL again? Uh, GMAC, G-E-M-A-C, dot club. Okay. Uh, you, can also, you should also be able to access it by going to gothamswords.com. Okay. Um, since the idea is Gotham Swords is probably easier to remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, will do. I am so sorry to have missed it. I, time zones are time zones are silly. Mm -hmm. time zones, I had I had a, the lecture I watched yesterday was at noon my time because it was seven o'clock in Israel. So time zones are silly and I want to get out of this winter time and back to having daylight again. Yeah. Big mood. So I have a question. I don't know yeah. if you know much about this history. So speaking of something like Vilna or Odessa or um, a center of Jewish life, uh, this wouldn't have been necessarily medieval, but this would have been uh, 16, 17, 1800s. Um, what sort of city guard might have existed um, in that kind of instance? Would there have been one? So that is a little out of the scope of my research. Mm -hmm. um, I do know in the medieval cities, um, the city guard was often conscripted or at, at times when the city really needed to be guarded, uh, it was, there was conscription, Christians and Jews being told, go man the city walls. Um, as we know, standing armies as such are a relatively modern invention. Okay. But as for like 18th century cities, um, I, I could tell you more about 18th century England than I can tell you about 18th century Judaism at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Look, you can't see it, but this entire shelf next to me is just English history. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, oops. Yeah. Well, nothing wrong with that. Um, so... If that is it, um, unless there's anything else anyone would like to discuss, I'm going to hop off and grab myself some dinner before I do more stuff. Sounds good. Thank you for uh, chatting. Uh, sure and, thing. Uh, this is, I, 
I've never had like 40 people show up to this lecture before. I've had like 10. So yeah. this is really yeah. cool. Cool. All right. All right. Have a good night. Be well. Hopefully I'll see y'all soon.